Hi guys, so this is going to be my first ever Q&A video, and I am, um, I just have Ruby here just so you guys have something to look at besides a blank screen, and I was going to paint while I did it and show you guys that, but I want to make sure my thoughts, my answers are clear and I don't get too distracted, and um, this Ruby is available on my website. I love her so much. I've wanted to paint her forever. And I'm hoping it's not like this on your screen. On my display, it looks like she has this, uh, where is it? This line here. Um, she does not have a line there in real life. I'm thinking it is, oh, it's the light right here. Okay. It's just the lighting. She doesn't have that for anyone uh, wondering. So uh, what I did, you guys send me messages all the time and I usually just answer them via email or a message or whatever. Um, but I have been saving them for a long time because I did want to do some Q and A's. Um, so what I did is I just took the first seven uh, in my list that I've been copying and pasting and I'm going to go ahead and just answer them. Okay, the first one, which is actually a good one because um, someone else recently asked me this question. Um, but it is, do you bake when your kids are still wet or let them dry all the way first? I have problems with texture if I try to bake wet. And I bake when my kids are wet still. I throw them into the oven right away. And I'm going to tell you why I do that. Um, the first reason is that I am impatient <laughs> and, um, you know, doing this as a job, I, you know, I paint, I bake, it's like a little assembly line in here. Um, but the bigger, like more important reason is if I am doing varnish or anything that has any white in it at all, um, meaning anything that is a Genesis color that is not O2 or primary. So if I'm using um, fallow blue O5, that has white in it. O3 has white in it. If I let my paint dry completely before putting it in the oven, those areas get chalky. Um, so I bake right away. Um, as far as issues with texture, um, my first question would be, what kind of material do you have in your oven? Um, I do have a video showing how to set up your oven, um, but this is what I use, Gerber Flat Bird's Eye Cloth Diapers. Um, I have been using these for a very long time, and they have pretty much no texture. I know when you like look up or in a lot of groups, other classes, they tell you to use a hand towel or a towel of some sort. Towels have a lot of texture. Um, when I first started, I did use a towel and I had that same issue. Since I started using the cloth diapers over my polyfill, I have not once had a single texture issue. Um, the other issue some people have sometimes is with stuff smearing um, if you put it in wet. And I will say this, and I don't know a better way to word it, so I'm not trying to sound like a jerk, so please do not take it. <laughs> don't take it that way. Just take what I'm saying at face value. If you don't want to smear your work in the oven, do not move it around in the oven. Um, if you know, if I have this leg that is wet and I want to put it in the oven, I hold it by the flange. Say that this is the side of my oven. It has my cloth diaper over it. I put this in the oven. I set it down. I don't touch it. I'm not laying it like this. I'm not scooting it around to try to get it into the right spot. I know where I'm putting it before I put it in and I put it in that spot and I leave it. Um, if you don't smear your work around, your work won't get smeared. Um, so yeah, that is that. I, I do it to be faster. I do it to prevent chalkiness. Um, I do know some people and some instructions say 
you have to let it dry 100% or your whole oven's going to blow up. It'll blow up your whole house. Um, I have not been flashing my work for as long, almost as long as I have been painting. I have never had an issue with a fire or anything. Um, just the amount of time it takes after you finish painting your piece before you actually set it in the oven, walking to the oven, opening the lid, setting it down. The amount of actual flammable material there that could catch on fire is so tiny. Um, like, I don't know if you guys, that Mythbusters show, I'm sure if they were to do it, they would probably say this is not even possible. But if you do have a fire, don't blame me. <laughs> but it's it's definitely not likely. Okay, the next question is, why do you why do you do all the burnt umber on the ear and nose holes? And um, the simplest answer is to make it look realistic, um, like there is an opening there, so you want it to look darker. When I first started, um, the popular way to do it, and I think there's still a lot of really old artists that still do uh, this technique, but it was just to take a blob of straight uh, Mars black paint and stick it up the nose or stick it in the ear hole. Um, it was straight paint, just one layer, just the blob in there. And um, from far away, it looks fantastic. It looks like their nose actually has a hole, their ear actually has a hole. Um, but what I did not like about that technique is when you look at it up close, it's very obvious, like it looks like an afterthought. It's very obvious that there is just a black blob of paint right there. And that was something that I had other artists were telling me. Um, I mean, I didn't have them telling me, but I saw other artists complaining that their customers were complaining that it looked cheaply done, that all they did was put a blob of paint there. And um, so it started becoming a problem. So um, to get rid of that issue, what I did is I don't use uh, black. Sometimes I will mix black with ever umber or something if I want it darker and it's just not getting as dark as I want it. But I build it up really slowly. Um, it gives the exact same effect of looking like there's a hole there, um, but it just looks a lot more cleaner, more professional up close. So that is why I do that. Um, my next question is when will you do a class? Okay, this is something that I'm super excited about, and I know I talked about it a few video ago, a few videos ago. So I have been having some people ask me. I am shooting for a February start date for a class. Um, I don't hold me to that 100%. I really, really want to do it in February. I'm working my butt off trying to get a format, um, you know, like a plan of exactly what I'm going to include, what I need, how to do it, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I was just going to do one class. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to offer several classes. Um, I really want to do classes broken up by skill level, um, which I think is really important um, just based on some of the feedback I've gotten from some of you guys. I don't want a new brand new artist who doesn't even know how to mix paint yet to be totally lost. And I don't want an advanced artist to get frustrated having to sit through really basic uh, questions that they know, you know, that they already know. I want each class to have something really great that every single level can take away from it. So I think the easiest and best way it sounds like to do that is to do it in different levels. So I will have different levels. I will have an advanced rooting class and I will likely have a beginner rooting class as well. Um, so I don't know which one of those will be my first class that I'll be doing, but it's something that I'm actively working on every single day just planning it out and you guys on YouTube, I'll announce it to you guys first so you will know first. Okay, this one is kind of a funny one that it is shocking how many, how often I get this question. At least once a week, somebody messages me and asks me this. Where are you from? What is that accent? Okay, I don't think I have an accent at all. So this one cracks me up. Um, I'm from California. I'm from the USA. Um, I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California, which is 
um, the Bay Area. So think like San Francisco, San Jose. It's just a teeny a touch south of that area. It's a really great surfer town right on the coast. Um, I know that I say like a lot. It's involuntary. I don't like saying it. I feel like it makes me sound like a less intelligent valley girl, but it's involuntary. So. <laughs> but that is where I'm from. Um, and yeah, that is why I talk like that, I guess. If it's some other weird accent you guys are hearing, I honestly have no idea. Um, the next question is what kind of thinner are you using? And why don't you use Mona Lisa? So this person, obviously, they don't know what I'm using, but they know it's not Mona Lisa. Okay, so what I am using is this. It is Clean Strip Odorless Mineral Spirits. Um, they do have a green version. The green version is white. You don't want the green version. You want this clear version. The white one does change the color of your paint into, like, pastel colors that stays over after you bake it. So... Uh, you want the clear one. Um, I do have Mona Lisa right here. You could tell how old this bottle is. It's still full to cure. This is how often I use it. This one's from 2020, so I never use it. And I do have Gamsol, which I use occasionally, but not very often. The reasons that I use Clean Strip are the exact reasons I don't prefer the other two. Um, clean strip is very low in oil, so it gives you a pretty much instant flash off. Uh, what you put on is what stays. It doesn't, um, there's no drippy oils, no excess oil really that is dripping around. Um, and so I really like it. There are certain instances that I do prefer Mona Lisa. If I'm doing, if I'm trying to do a light, very light creamy complexion where I am using colors that have white, which I never do in my regular babies. I pretty much, once in a while, I'll use like a pink or something, but I don't use things that have a lot of white. Um, when I do use a lot of white, though, um, I'll use Mona Lisa because it has a lot of oil in it, so it can prevent chalkiness. Um, or I will add a couple drops of linseed oil or Exodus thinning oil, which is awesome. It's just thinning medium without the part that makes it thick. Um, so it works pretty much exactly the same as linseed oil. Or I'll add a touch of thinning medium. Um, if you are a beginner painter and you need extra work time, this is not going to be the best for you. Um, if you need extra work time, you need something more oily and you will like Mona Lisa. If you're a quick painter and you don't want your stuff to stay wet forever, Clean Strip is going to be fantastic for you. Um, Gamsol ha is the highest oil one. It's even oilier than Mona Lisa. So this is really great for like straight white and it also really helps with like streaks and dirty looking paint if you're doing like AA babies or something Gamsol is the go-to for dark complexions or like all white either one they help a lot with that okay the next qu question is I follow another artist who does texture layers with kitchen sponges I don't see you use them why not Okay, so you are correct. You don't see me use kitchen sponges because I don't, I don't use kitchen sponges. And, you know, I actually, I actually used to follow that same artist like everybody when I first started. And I used to use kitchen sponges. Um, I also used to use these tack sponges and sea sponges. Um, kitchen sponges, tack sponges, sea sponges, they work fantastic with air dry. Like they really leave a nice pattern. They work great. They do not work great with the oil in heat set paint. Um, these, the sponges, the kitchen sponges do not absorb the oil. They just sit right on top. So when you put it on, like even if you pounce it, when you put it on, you're getting a drip solid area. It's not leaving a defined pattern there. Um, that is really important to me. I really, really like on my babies, um, I want my skin to look as realistic as possible. I want you to see tons of little pinprint 
imperfections that actually make up our real skin. Um, so that is why I don't use them. Um, my, what you, I never know what to call them, but I'll just start calling them texture layers because really that's what they are. I use sponges that I make that are like this. You can see the difference between a regular modeling sponge and this one that I use for texture. Um, this one used to be a bright white, believe it or not, um, cosmetic round. It is made out of the same exact material as a cosmetic wedge. Um, it's just in a round shape and it's larger, um, which I prefer for more coverage area. Um, I am going to be making more of these soon. I only have like two left right now, so I desperately need to make some and I will show that in a video. Um, but if you're using heat set paint, um, this kind of material works the best. Um, I do also sometimes use one of these round cosmetic, or, oh gosh, I'm out of it. Okay, sorry. Uh, these round craft sponges. They can have the same issue though as the kitchen sponges. So I really only do this when I'm working with a very a thicker paint, something I've added thinning medium to that is not like a runny model or wash consistency. Um, the same thing with the kitchen sponges. If I use a really wet uh, paint on here, I'm gonna put it on and it's just gonna drip down or it'll be a solid print. It's not, even if I do it super lightly, it's not gonna leave the little pin print, pin print pattern that I like, um, unless, like I said, it's a thicker paint. So, you know, that's why. The sponges and sea sponges and even these are, if you're using air dry, it does not get better. Air dry has water, the sponges absorb it, they put it on, it's a fantastic pattern. Heat set, thinners are oil-based. You're putting oil on something meant to be absorbed by water and it doesn't work the same way. Um, okay, the last question. This one, okay, I'm gonna answer it and then I'm gonna do a mini rant um, education thing after. And don't come for me if you don't agree with me. If you don't agree with me, you don't have to. We can have different opinions, but I'm gonna give my my honest insight and opinion on it. Um, so this question is, how do you decide how much to sell your Reborns for? So, okay, right now, which is the price range I've been selling in for a couple of years, um, most of my babies cost $1,200. Um, my range goes anywhere from $800 to $1,800. Um, but most of my regular, like Ruby hair is $1,200. And um, some of them, you know, if it's an unpopular sculpt, if I don't love it, if I feel like that's just not my best work, but it doesn't have like a noticeable boo-boo, but I just don't care for it, I tend to mark it down to the 800 range. Um, if it's a sold out limited edition kit, um, usually I will do it at the higher range and that is because usually either that means that I have bought the kit for a lot more on the secondary market or I have held the kit in really good condition and it is worth a buttload now. So I'm going to sell the baby for more. Um, when I first started, I did the very, very basic, it's called the times three method. Um, and this is a really good like beginner method to keep you from charging too little for your work. Um, you add up the complete cost of your materials. Um, I just don't mean like the cost of the kit. I mean all of your materials, your paint, your varnish, your glass beads, your polyfill, your hair, like every single thing that you use on that baby, you add up and then you multiply that amount times three and that total gives you a fee for your time um, and usually that ends up being about five hundred dollars and sometimes a little bit more I personally really strongly believe that is the minimum amount that new artists should be selling for I don't think that new artists should be selling for like the cost of materials at all um, and it is an issue that I guess I'm going to talk about it for a minute because it is a huge issue 
Like right now, the reborn market is so, so bad. And it is completely flooded with really low priced babies. Um, I see a lot of people complain, a lot of artists that complain about this. They'll like post, you know, on Facebook groups or wherever, um, complaining about how people want something for almost nothing while they're like lowering their prices more and more. They're selling for the cost of materials. And it really frustrates me because I don't understand like why they can't see that if they weren't selling reborns for this cheap, people wouldn't expect them to buy them for this cheap because they wouldn't be available. Like I'd love a Tesla for 500 bucks, but they aren't available for 500 bucks. So it's not going to happen for me. Like if I want, you know, something else for $500, a beater, I can still get a car for $500. There are boo-boo babies, there's used babies, there's babies available for a really small amount of money out there um, that are authentic, real reborns. Um, you know, the fakes is a whole another issue um, that is really messing up our market. But, you know, even if you take that out of the equation, there's so many artists that are contributing like where that are messing up the market too and when people undervalue their work they're contributing to that issue when i first started reborning the only reborns you could find for 500 dollars or under were very poorly done reborns they you could tell they were only worth that but people were still charging for their time Reborns take a lot of time, obviously, to create. You guys know this. You're artists as well, most of you. So it is so important to pay yourself for your time with that, like, times three basic rate. And then as you improve, charge more. Make sure that you're looking at how every single baby you're going to probably be improving. Every single baby, look at that. Is this baby worth more than a basic rate? Can I up my pay rate? And like I said, I do a general range. I don't add up my materials anymore. They're all about the same. Um, I just add extra here or there, kind of depending on the quality of the baby. And I think that that's a great method, obviously, because I do it now. <laughs> but that is like the easiest method. Um, if I get, and this is speaking like totally business-minded, and if I get a kit on sale, I'm not discounting the price of that completed baby. That $20 discount or whatever I got is going to add to my little bit of profit. And I think that that is so important. There's so many people that want to like pass down their savings. And I get that. There's, there's people out there who want to sell for materials costs. They want everybody to be able to afford a baby. And I'm trying to think of an, a nice way to word this. I guess no matter how altruistic the intentions are, they're still destroying the market by doing it. If there weren't, you know, $250 babies, everybody would not be expecting $250 babies. And it's a big problem with the market now. Like people, high-end artists are having to lower their costs to try to compete. And it's just never ending. Um, you know, like I look at it like, like I'll give you, a, hopefully I don't mess this up. Because I said this to somebody a little bit ago that when we were arguing about it, kind of. Um, but I said it's like kind of like the average person can't afford a Ferrari. I wish everyone could have one. Like there are beaters available for 500 bucks, but I want everyone to have a luxury car. Like, so I start selling Ferraris for 500 bucks and my friends are like, oh, she's making some money selling them for that. I'm gonna do that too. So they start selling them for 500 bucks. And then suddenly dealerships that sell them for a hundred grand, they have to compete with my prices, but they do it professionally. It's not a side job that is their business so they can't lower their prices as much as i can because i'm just doing it on the side getting a little extra money for it so dealerships they start going out of business completely 
And then suddenly Ferraris aren't worth anything anymore because any, everybody has them and anyone can buy them for 500 bucks. They're, you know, they're not a fantastic kind of out of reach thing to reach for a really special, like one rare thing to have anymore. So nobody really wants them. And then like someone else starts selling them for 350 and then I have to lower my prices. I've been selling them for 500. Now they're available for 350. I can lower my prices or I can go out of business and like so on and on and on it goes, right? So it's really great for people who want to buy Ferraris. It's really terrible for business and it's the exact same thing. Like the thing about Reborns being so special is because they're a one of a kind fine art item and they should be priced like that. Would, you know, when we spend hundreds of hours creating them, we should not be expected to pay or to sell them for the price of materials. It is not right. It did not used to be that way, but more and more people are lowering their prices so much and it is destroying our market. Like I said, we have enough going against us with fakes and stuff. Um, you know, we don't need that from fellow artists contributing to the issue. And I know that's not like a popular, uh, I'll say that is, the po that is the most popular closet opinion. It's not something a lot of people are willing to say publicly um, because you look like a money grubbing jerk. But if you're reborning, it is your business. You need to, you need to think about that when you're selling. You can love people. You can wish everyone could have a mansion. You, everyone could have a five thousand dollar reborn. But that's not the way that it works. And if someone has like, I know a lot of my clients, especially they do use them for anxiety, for loss, for just holding something that weighs with the weight and feel of a baby is helpful. And if that is really all that they are going for, there are plenty of used reborns, lower end reborns, boo-boo babies that are available for crazy dirt cheap prices. If you're creating beautiful babies, then keep in mind about supporting the entire market by keeping your prices higher the way that they have been and should stay otherwise we're all going to be out of business eventually and that really bums me out that's the end of my little rant i'm sure i'm going to get some hate for that i usually always do i get you know not everyone can afford reborns you know there's a lot of things i can't afford and reborns aren't a necessity they're beautiful, fine art pieces. I can't afford the Mona Lisa, but, you know, they're not giving them out to everybody. I just want to keep them, like, a valued thing, something that people continue to want, and something that we can continue to create and earn a living doing so. So I hope that even if you don't agree with me, that you understand what I was saying about it, and hopefully it'll give you something to think about. All right, my little rant's over. Um, so that is going to be it. If you guys want to submit more questions, I'll put my email address in the description. I love getting them. I would love to do more Q&As. I think it's a great opportunity to share a little bit of knowledge and for you guys to get to know me a little bit better. Um, so I will see you in the next one.